We will hear argument this morning in case 19508, AMG Capital Management versus the Federal Trade Commission. Mr. Potillo? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. The FTC Act's text, structure, and purpose make clear that when Section 13B authorizes the Commission to seek a permanent injunction, it means just that, a permanent injunction as traditionally understood. It does not mean injunctions and all equitable relief or injunctions and monetary relief for past harms. Three features of the Act make that especially clear. First, 13B is limited to cases where someone is violating or is about to violate the Act. That limit to ongoing or imminent violations would make no sense if 13B authorized retrospective monetary relief for past harms. Second, where the Act allows relief beyond injunctions, it says so. Section 5L authorizes an injunction and further equitable relief as appropriate. That language would have been pointless if the word injunction itself implied all equitable relief. Third, another provision, Section 19, authorizes monetary relief for past consumer injury, but it provides safeguards, including a statute of limitations, a heightened proof requirement, and notice to victims. Those limits would be meaningless if they could be evaded under 13B. Even if there were a presumption that mentioning a specific type of equitable relief meant all equitable relief, and there should not be, those three features overcome it. To be clear, the Commission can get retrospective relief for consumer harm, but it must invoke Section 19, the mechanism Congress provided for that purpose. That makes sense. Because the Act's prohibitions are broad and general, Congress since 1914 made agency processes the primary enforcement mechanism so the agency can apply its expertise and give businesses notice on what is prohibited. Section 13B, by contrast, is a narrow supplement for threatened harm, where the Commission must come to court to stop the conduct quickly. Where there is more time, like for backward-looking remedies, there was no reason for Congress to bypass agency responsibility to provide guidance. Mr. Fotillo, uh, one of the issues with your reading of the statute uh, is that it was passed uh, roughly 50 years ago. And uh, in the intervening years, there's been a significant change in how this court interprets statute statutes. Back when it, uh, this one was passed, we had a pretty uh, freewheeling approach. You know, we weren't as confined to the specific language. You sort of look at what Congress had in mind and, and figured out the meaning in light of that. And, uh, of course, today we have a more disciplined approach. Um, you know, I think more suited to our role under the Constitution. But shouldn't we construe this statute um, uh, in the environment in which Congress passed it in light of the, uh, as I said, more freewheeling approach? And uh, uh, I think there'd be a lot um, more leeway to your uh, friend on the other side argument about an expansive reading of some of the language. So why why do we uh, sort of uh, adopt a... uh, I don't know what it is, uh, view that, that is current today but wasn't current back then. Your Honor, I have two responses to that question. The first is, is that this court um, rejected a very similar argument in Alexander v. Sandoval. Uh, the argument was made that, um, listen, at the time that Title VI of the Civil Rights Act was enacted, uh, the court at that time followed what you referred to as a more freewheeling approach to um, implying causes of action and implied remedies. And the court said, be that as it may, you know, we have since sworn off that method of statutory interpretation and we decline, uh, you know, one one last drink. And I think that that applies equally here. Uh, Whether or not that was the mode at the time uh, 13B was enacted. The, the reasoning of Alexander versus Sandoval. Yeah, you know, I, I, I know that's. I know that's what we said. I maybe I just don't find that so so compelling. It's 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 a um, you know we try to uh, look at language as it was understood in other contexts when we're interpreting uh, provisions. You know, we go back to the you know 1860 treatise and say what did that mean back then, and we don't look at a contemporary dictionary. Um, uh, do you have any argument besides what we said in Sandoval? Yes, I do. The theory that Congress somehow thought permanent injunction carried with it all equitable relief when it enacted 13B itself defies the three features I mentioned in my opening. In the very same legislation that it enacted 13B, Congress expressly authorized an injunction 
and other and further equitable relief in Section 5L. So that cannot be reconciled with the notion that Congress somehow thought in the word injunction itself automatically included all equitable relief, a la Porter's um, method of interpretation. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Justice Thomas? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, counsel, uh, let's, uh, continuing along the lines of the Chief Justice, let's assume um, that we did not have uh, Sections uh, 5 and 19, um, and, but you, can, you still have the same language that we have in 13. Um, would, would it be reasonable to say that Congress legislated against, the, in that case, in that instance, against the backdrop of cases like Porter and Mitchell? And if so, then how would that change your argument? Um, this court looks to how equitable terms are traditionally understood, and permanent injunctions uh, traditionally exclude monetary relief as compensation for past harm as Great West noted. And here, um, the, the phrase 13B itself refers to a permanent injunction. And you wouldn't ordinarily think of a one-time order to turn over property as a permanent, as a permanent injunction. And so the, the specific language used in 13B itself, even without reference, but also 13B is limited to cases of imminent or ongoing harm. And it wouldn't have made any sense to authorize retrospective, to, to, to link uh, the authority for retrospective monetary relief to the availability of imminent or ongoing harm. Consumers don't become more or less worthy of redress for their injuries, depending on whether or not the conduct is ongoing. Well, with that argument, how would you address or deal with the uh, 19th century intellectual property cases uh, that allowed uh, monetary relief incident to the uh, injunction? Um, all of those cases involved a situation where there was um, the parties had a general right to seek all equitable relief, uh, and that is simply not the case here. Um, this case, 13B, is just limited to injunctions. So whether or not um, the other relief of an accounting might be available where all equitable relief is available to the plaintiff, that's not the case here. Injunction means injunction in 13B, and we know that, and it's limited by the three features of the Act that I've mentioned. Thank you. Justice Breyer? Good morning. I I thought the briefs were very good in this case. Blue brief, I think you're right. Red brief, I think you're right. They can't both be right. That's right. All right. You see, that's the old joke. But that's where I am. So, I'm pretty familiar with the arguments, and I see uh, which way do we go. And the argument, it seems to me, that's against you, and I'll put the other half to the other side. The argument that's against you is simply this, to me. Law isn't perfect. Courts make mistakes. We make mistakes, too. And this is, if it is a mistake, it's been around for 50 years, and there's a pretty uniform interpretation before the Seventh Circuit. And if we never say let bygones be godgones, I mean, we're going to be here to Marbury versus Madison and beyond. So, too much time has passed. Water under the bridge. Goodbye. Well, why doesn't that apply? Well, Your Honor, this is the first time that the court was called to, to step in to, to resolve this conflict, and the, the mode of interpretation has, has changed o over time, and uh, the, when the courts of appeals took this approach... Oh, I'm uh, going to see, wait, for my question, I'm assuming you're right on all that, okay? My question is, still, it's close, and still... The lower courts, at least, have been uniform for 50 years. We cannot undo everything that was, in your opinion, or mine, or somebody else's, decided not perfectly and may be wrong. That's what I just asked. Well, and so why wouldn't I follow that very basic principle about courts and how the judiciary has to function in a society that's continuously changing? There are now two courts of appeals, one on either side, or excuse me, on, there are courts of appeals on either side. There are now 
two courts of appeals that have rejected the notion that 13B carries with it all monetary relief, and there's simply no rule uh, that the first court of appeals to uh, issue its ruling on a particular version of the law wins. And so uh, there's no reason to give a, a presumption to the, the courts of appeals that decided it first. Okay, thank you. Justice Alito? Uh, Mr. Patello, could I ask you about uh, the practicalities of, of this case? Has some of the money in question here already been distributed to the victims of this scheme? Yes. My understanding is that around um, $500 million has been distributed. If we rule in your favor, what will happen with respect to those individuals? Will they be required to return that money? Uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, I would be surprised uh, if, if that is the result. Um, one option would perhaps be um, for the commission would have to um, repay us out of, out of the federal judgment fund, uh, which you know, is a reservoir that exists for paying liabilities of the United States. Um, I suppose it would be up to the commission to decide whether um, the uh, United States bears the burden of its error. What is the relationship between the, the order in question here and the forfeiture order that was issued in the Southern District of New York in Tucker's criminal case? There he was, as I understand it, required to return $3 billion. Is that, does that encompass the amount of money that's involved here? Uh, there is... My understanding is that there is some overlap between um, the assets that were at issue. I mean, it, it, Mr. Tucker just had, had one pool of, of resources, and to date, my understanding is that the commission and the Southern District have been divvying up the different responsibilities. But it's also worth noting here that the order in this case encompasses, um, encompasses money paid by um, innocent parties such as Mrs. Tucker and Part 269, which were never alleged to have been, uh, yeah, and that amount is over $27 million. They were never alleged to have participated in any wrongdoing. And so those assets certainly couldn't be subject to the criminal forfeiture as well. So let me turn back briefly to basically the same question that the Chief Justice asked. Uh, if I mean, most of the members of Congress are not lawyers. Uh, that was true when this provision was enacted. And even those who were lawyers, perhaps like me, never heard the word equity when they were in law school. So suppose one of those members said, well, here we're going to authorize the commission to seek an injunction. So I'm going to look at the most recent edition of Black's Law Dictionary, which defines an injunction in part as a judicial process operating in personam and requiring person to whom it is directed to do or refrain from doing a particular thing. Uh, if the member read that definition, wouldn't they think that it would authorize exactly what was done here? Uh, per, per, perhaps there uh, injunctions are broad and flexible, um, and certainly, as, as the court explained in Great West, with lawyerly inventiveness, just about any order could be framed in terms of, a junction, of an injunction. But this court has held that it, it's not just what Black's Law Dictionary says. It's how the terms are traditionally understood in equity. And permanent injunctions traditionally exclude um, monetary relief as compensation for past harm. The fact right, that the thank, commission... Thank you. I, I think my time Justice, has expired. Justice Sotomayor? Counsel, you argue that there would be no reason for Congress to provide for monetary remedies under Section 19 if the FTC could obtain disgorgement under 13B. But it makes sense to me that the FTC might sometimes want to establish new rules through agency adjudications that are binding on absent parties and to which courts will defer. So the more important question for me is, and I hope you can answer it, is why would Congress authorize the FTC to seek a permanent injunction 
if no other equitable remedies were available. It seems that under your understanding of the statute, why would the FTC ever pursue a permanent injunction under 13B rather than a cease and desist order that could lead to monetary relief? It could look for... The answer is that... Go ahead. Sometimes... I'm sorry. The answer is that 13B is a, it's a narrow supplement to the overall FTC Act, which, is, which almost every other single provision is about or in service of administrative processes. 13B exists for situations where there is threatened or ongoing harm, and it allows the commission to come to court to stop the conduct quickly in but order it could to give do that. We could do that with a temporary injunction. Um, and so it doesn't need to do it with a permanent injunction, and if it's barred from getting um, permanent relief and remedies, why would it ever seek a permanent injunction? It would, it just, if, it, if there's no need, if it's a routine case where um, the agency doesn't need to pronounce, um, as, as is its statutory obligation, to define uh, whether or not, and apply its expertise and define whether particular conduct is prohibited, um, the, the permanent injunction passed through district court might be a, um, a quicker and more expedient remedy. But the fact is that um, the, the, the act's prohibitions are broad in general, and Congress made agency processes the primary enforcement mechanism. And its job is to apply... So why, why even give it a permanent injunction when it wasn't, according to your reading, able to recover anything else under that process? It could always do a temporary injunction and stop, impe- and stop impending harm that way and then always have to pursue administrative process to get monetary relief. It makes no sense to me. Because... Sometimes that would, be, that would be good enough. Sometimes just stopping the conduct is a sufficient remedy in and of itself. There won't always need to be um, consumer redress in every case. And, in fact, you know, for most of, the, most of the FTC's early history, it had no authority to seek consumer redress whatsoever until it was enacted in, in Section 19. Stopping the conduct was its primary responsibility. Justice Kagan? Mr. Patillo, I'd like to go back to the Chief Justice's first questions about which approach we're supposed to use. Our uh, old approach, which was very liberal in finding rights and remedies, or our new approach, which is decidedly not. And you said, uh, well, Alexander V. Sandoval, and the Chief asked you to put that, the Chief Justice asked you to put that aside, and I'd like you to put that aside as well. I think it's at least arguably very different. Do you have a, a theoretical argument for why it is that we should be using the new approach? Because I would have thought that the whole idea behind the new approach is that what matters most is uh, what Congress thinks about a question, not what the court thinks about it. And that that would suggest, well, we're supposed to be looking at what Congress thought in 1973, given the backdrop of all of our precedents. Well... As I mentioned, the, the, the words of the statute are the law. The words of the statute tell you what Congress intended. And it, even under the old approach, what, if we're trying to discern whether Congress thought that, you know, p- that injunction actually meant all relief, all we need to know is that at the same time that Congress enacted 13B, it also enacted Section 5L. And at that time, it expressed that's that's an argument. I mean, uh, that's an argument on a different point, a point about what Congress would have understood back then. But but I take that to be assuming my premise, which is that the very issue is, I mean, that the thing we're supposed to be figuring out is what Congress would have assumed back then, isn't it? Yes, but I think in in trying to think what Congress understood about Porter and Mitchell, we, we have to look at what else Porter and Mitchell said. And notwithstanding Porter and Mitchell's broad language, um, Congress also would have known that Porter and Mitchell said, you have to look at the entire statute. Well, and you have in, to in see just, if the, sorry, Mr. Patel, in, 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 in just two years before um, Congress uh, enacted this legislation, 
The Second Circuit, uh, you know, obviously an important circuit when it comes to these matters, uh, held that the SEC had power to seek restitution because its statute said that the agency could seek an injunction. The exact same question uh, as is um, uh, as, as we're confronting. And the Second Circuit relies on Porter, relies on Mitchell, relies on all the old cases that you say are distinguishable, and, uh, and says, yes, an injunction includes restitution according to Supreme Court law on the subject. So doesn't that suggest that the FTC has a pretty good point about what Congress understood in 1973? No, I don't think so. If, if, the, if Congress were looking to what Porter held, Porter acknowledged that um, if it was looking to see whether an implied remedy was consistent, it had to look and see if the implied remedy was consistent with the statutory scheme. And Porter found that even though there was nothing that precluded an implied restitution remedy, it said, look, there is another section of the Emergency Price Control Act, and that provision addresses damages. So the fact that the, that the statute elsewhere mentions damages supersedes the possibility that there could be an implied damages remedy. So Thank, if you, Congress will look- Thank you very much. Justice Gorsuch. Good morning, counsel. Um, I, I'd like your help with a, a line drawing problem. Uh, I, I think you agree that an injunction can be used to provide certain forms of equitable um, relief, including restitution, perhaps, an accounting, uh, requiring a freezing of assets or handing over a thing of value. Uh, but but it's, it, it can't go this far. How would you have us draw that line and describe it? I think it's a I think it's a fairly simple line, and we can look to how Justice Story described it. There's a difference between there's a difference between the initial determination as to who owns the property, whether property should be returned, and that principle is articulated in terms of other equitable doctrines such as restitution. Now, there were instances in the past, and these were, you know, more the, certainly more the exception than the rule, where an injunction might use, be used to enforce that prior decree, um, where, where someone had already been given an, the, the award of restitution that determines the property right. And then if there was some other reason why um, an additional coercive remedy was needed, the injunction might issue to force that. As, as just the story explained in his treatise, that type of injunction was issued, quote, after a decree in the nature of an execution to enforce the underlying decree. And that's completely different from what the commission seeks here. The commission doesn't seek to use an injunction to enforce a right to restitution. It doesn't have a right to restitution under 13B. It's trying to to, to bootstrap that. And so I, I think that the distinction at equity was actually pretty clear. Thank you, counsel. Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, Thank you, Chief Justice, and good morning, uh, counsel. Uh, Your argument here is strikingly similar to the argument um, advanced in the dissent in Porter by Justice Rutledge, joined by Justices Reed and Frankfurter, and the dissent in Mitchell, uh, written by Justice Whitaker, joined by Justices Black and Clark. Uh, The Rutledge dissent, Justice Rutledge dissent in Porter, for example, said Congress could not have been ignorant of the remedy of restitution. It knew how to give remedies it wished to confer. There was no need to add this one, nor do I think it did so. It did not give it expressly. That kind of argument. What do we do with Porter and Mitchell uh, if we decide this case in your favor? In other words, how should we write the opinion with respect to those cases? Um, this court doesn't need to overrule Porter or Mitchell any more than it needed to do so in Megrig, which held that in the context of RICRA, injunction did not mean all equitable relief. Neither Porter nor Mitchell involved the statute with the three features that I mentioned at the outset. In neither case did Congress elsewhere authorize an injunction and other and further equitable relief, making it clear that Congress didn't presume that an injunction carried with it all equitable relief. Neither Porter nor Mitchell addressed the statute limited to ongoing or threatened violations, which is the sort of thing that an injunction would address, but is totally inconsistent with backwards-looking monetary relief. Uh, And neither statute in Porter or Mitchell 
provided the very same monetary relief in a separate provision, here that's Section 19, subject to various protections like a statute of limitations, that would be rendered entirely meaningless if the Commission could implicitly get the same relief under 13b instead. So Porter and Mitchell are entirely distinguishable based on the statutory scheme. And picking up on one of Justice Breyer's questions, when you have the combination of Porter and Mitchell plus some uh, maybe broad, you would say too tangential, but some congressional ratification uh, argument and all the Court of Appeals for a number of years uh, interpreting it in the FTC's favor. At some point, does that all that combine, uh, do you think, to get us to a point of leave well enough alone? I mean, that's certainly uh, stability in the law is important, and when you have Porter and Mitchell plus ratification plus courts of appeals, at some point does that kick in? I don't think so. Longstanding error doesn't make it any less error. The statute is still the statute, and now that the issue is before this court, it's the court's duty to give the correct interpretation of the statute, notwithstanding a a long history of error. Thank you. Justice Barrett? Counsel, let's say that we agree with you about 13b. Your client, I I don't understand you to be arguing that he has clean hands. I mean, he's been convicted. He has the dubious distinction of being the subject of an episode of Dirty Money on Netflix. But you, you suggested in your brief that because of the safeguards of Section 19, in particular, you know, the, the reasonable man standard, knowing and understanding that the conduct was deceptive, that the FTC couldn't have um, gotten a monetary remedy from him under 19. So is it your position that if we adopt your view, there's no way for the FTC to get the ill-gotten gains back from someone who has violated the law like your client? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to suggest that the FTC could not have proven its case under Section 19, although I do think there is a substantial question about that. In, the, in Judge B's dissent, in the decision below, he noted that you know, the three judges on the Ninth Circuit had looked at the disclosures, and they thought that they were accurate, and they were not deceived by that. But notwithstanding that, the fact is that you know, the decision here doesn't just affect my client. It doesn't just affect, you know, payday lenders. As our amici, the chamber, has pointed out, and as, you know, this is, the sweep of the FTC Act is about as broad as you can get, reaching into every single area of commerce. And it's precisely because the prohibitions of the Act are so broad in general that it's important to hold the Commission to its primary responsibility of, you know, telling businesses what the law is prospectively instead of running to court instead, you know, trying to seek retrospective monetary relief. Thank you, counsel. A minute to wrap up. Mr. Patillo. The question here is whether 13B's reference to permanent injunction means permanent injunction or whether it instead means all equitable relief and money for past harm. The three features of the act that I've discussed confirm that injunction is limited to an injunction as that term was traditionally understood. To be any clearer, Congress would have to take the absurd step of saying, and by injunction, we mean only injunction, not other remedies. But this court does not impose and never has imposed any such requirement. The FTC Act, moreover, is striking in its consistent focus on agency processes to prospectively define prohibited conduct. Yet under the Commission's view, the single sentence, second-level proviso in 13b authorizing permanent injunctions is virtually all the statute it needs. The Commission can get all the injunctive and monetary relief at once without the burdens of the administrative processes that were its very reason for being. That cannot be right. The Court should return the Commission to the limits that Congress placed on its authority. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Mr. Marcus. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. The petitioners are asking you to rule that when Congress allowed the Commission to enforce the FTC Act in federal court, it intended that the Court would merely stop the violation while letting the violator keep his stolen money. 
Such a ruling would radically depart from the foundational principle of equity recognized just last term in lieu that wrongdoers should not profit from their own wrongdoing. It would also profoundly deviate from the understanding of injunctive remedies that was embedded in the law when Congress enacted Section 13B, as many of the Court's questions have recognized. Courts of equity have recognized since before the founding that the equitable power to issue an injunction inherently includes the power to order the return of unlawful gains. As the Court summed it up in Porter, nothing is more clearly the subject of a suit for an injunction than the recovery of that which has been illegally acquired and which has given rise to the necessity for injunctive relief. Sections 19 and 5L of the Act, which provide remedies when the Commission chooses to enforce the Act administratively, do not create an unmistakable inference that Congress intended to limit traditional equitable powers when the Commission chooses instead to proceed in court. Section 19 expressly says otherwise in the Savings Clauses. Section 5L serves a fundamentally different role in the Act than Section 13B, and its language reflects its function. A cease and desist order works like a prohibitory injunction. Congress, therefore, had to specify the additional remedies it wanted for a violation. It did not need to do that in Section 13B, but could instead invoke its understanding of the traditional equitable powers of injunction without the need for elaboration. Together, the sections, sections 13B, 19, and 5L work in harmony to give the Commission a choice between effective enforcement pathways that can provide meaningful relief to victimized consumers. Uh, Council, a lot of the uh, cases you, you cite in support of a broad reading of uh, uh, injunction, injunction and equitable powers, uh, in fact, I think most of them involve courts, uh, not agencies. And, and courts uh, have uh, broad, inherent uh, equitable power that you, you don't sort of parse and construe their authority uh, uh, very carefully, at least I don't think so, but this involves an agency, and an agency uh, uh, only has the authority delegated to it uh, by Congress, and I'm not sure we can assume that those precedents involving courts apply so smoothly in the context of an agency. Well, certainly the agency has the whatever power Congress has accorded it, which is exactly why Congress had to be more specific when it was talking about remedies for the agency's own adjudicatory orders. But um, uh, Section uh, 5, I'm sorry, Section 13B says the commission may seek and the court may grant a permanent injunction. So uh, what Congress is saying there is that uh, the commission can invoke the court's equitable authority, and that then puts the issue squarely within the court's authority, as you just alluded to. Well, I'm not sure that follows. The, the agency can seek and the court can enforce. doesn't mean that the uh, same uh, authority that a court has, the agency has, just that the court can enforce whatever authority the agency has. It doesn't say enforce. It says grant. Um, and uh, the court can enforce uh, under a different provision, Section 5, the Commission's own orders. But what Section 13B is doing is it's giving the Commission the ability to go to court to seek the relief that a court can grant. This is no different than what the Price Administrator did in Porter um, or the Department of Labor. In the, um, uh, your friend on the other side makes the a point that injunction appears in the United States Code uh, throughout the Code hundreds of times and uh, is your position that whenever it does, a uh, broader range of equitable powers is uh, conferred on an agency? Well, again, it's not that the uh, power is conferred on the agency. It's that the court has inherent powers. Now, it, in many cases, it, it may be appropriate uh, in, in conjunction with an injunction to engage in other types of equitable remedies, but it's not always appropriate. These are case-by-case -case determinations. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Justice Thomas? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, Mr. Marcus, uh, Section 13B1 uh, uh, says that um, 
whenever the commission has reason to believe that a person, partnership, or corporation is violating or is about to violate any provision of law. That seems to suggest that that provision is focused on uh, uh, forward-looking, preventing a a future or present action. Uh, It seems that what you're doing here is using it for something that has already happened. Would you be kind enough to uh, reconcile uh, your approach with the language of uh, 13b? I'd be happy to, Justice Thomas. Um, ISRA is about to uh, echoes the standard for the grant of an injunction. Uh, for example, uh, the, typically an injunction requires there to be ongoing or expected conduct. Um, uh, and, but once the court's equity jurisdiction has been properly invoked, the court can order associated remedial relief. And, um, and that's what happened in all of the 19th century intellectual property cases. And uh, in fact, in the Root case in particular, the court said, your injunction, I'm sorry, your uh, uh, patent has expired, therefore you can't seek an injunction and you cannot get a naked monetary remedy. But here, there was ongoing conduct at the time the FTC sued. The court granted an injunction. And the question is, once the court Uh, has had its authority triggered, once the court has exercised that authority, can it also engage in the traditional mechanisms of injunctive relief? And I think the answer in centuries of law is pretty clear. Would you um, just take a minute and explain again why, uh, from my uh, perspective, it seems as though what you're doing here fits more comfortably under Section 19, uh, but you, would you explain why the commission chooses to use uh, Section 13 rather than Section 19 again? Certainly. Well, it, for one thing, it is easier to use Section 13 in many respects than it is in Section 19, but also there are many cases where it doesn't take a lot of a commission expertise to explain why a particular act is deceptive. And here, certainly, it did not take the agency, or even the U.S. Attorney's Office for that matter, to explain to Scott Tucker that misleading people about the terms of their loan uh, was a deceptive act. So when the commission uh, feels that it doesn't need to expound on the, the, the meaning and boundaries of the FTC Act, it can bring cases under Section 13. Now, keep in mind, when it does that, it gives up a bunch of stuff. It gives up the ability to find its own facts. It gives up the somewhat broader remedies that Section 19 allows, including uh, Section 19 allows us to sue in state court as well as federal court. And so each, it's a little bit like the um, choice between rulemaking and adjudication uh, in, uh, you know, Bell Aerospace. Uh, Congress wanted the commission to have flexibility to choose between enforcement pathways. Justice Breyer? Uh, History matters. I think Justice Brandeis, when he started, uh, was faced with a business community that was very suspicious of the FTC's power and thought it would be abused, and a progressive community that thought it's absolutely necessary to bring bad business practices under control. So they compromised. The compromise was, you've got to do what the FTC says, but before it tells you to do something, it will find that what you're doing now is wrong. It will find that. It will be a cease and desist order, later expanded under Moss Magnuson, I think, to include violation of a rule. So, Section 5, cease and desist order or violation of a rule? Ha! Damages, some kinds. 19, the same thing. And now we have right in the middle, 13, no protection like that whatsoever. Do not worry, says the FTC. We will only use it in exceptional cases. Huh. In 2012, they repeal that. And now, 10 years later, after this has been in effect for a few years, I read that 100 cases under this provision are in the court compared with 10 or 12 under the regular cases. And you say it's just obvious we're going to get those people who think their bad conduct is obvious. Look at uh, Skechers. Look at the Cardinal case. 
Go back to the famous Unburn case. Add substantiation. People wouldn't know that it is an unfair practice that a chiropractor was married to a wife who had some income from the company and therefore his uh, conclusion as to the muscle toning of the company should be discounted. And that's the kinds of case they're bringing now. Now, you see my point? On the one hand, it's well-established law in the lower courts. On the other hand, if we interpret it your way, we we, we say, your fears, business community, were absolutely right. It is now up to the FTC, before you know the thing is wrong, to hit you with bad damages. This case, perhaps you're right. But Skechers, Cardinal, even Unburn, build strong bodies eight ways. That was wonder bread. They only did it six ways. I mean, you see, it's giving the FTC, that, that you get my point. Now, I'd like to hear an answer. I do get your point, Justice Breyer, and uh, the answer is that uh, in uh, 1914, when the, uh, when the commission was created, there was a bargain struck, and in 1973, when consumer fraud became rampant in the economy and people were complaining about the toothless FTC, there was a new bargain struck where the commission could go into court and uh, seek remedies in court as a litigant in the first instance. Um, courts are, of course, bound by principles of constitutional due process and notice, and if uh, the court concludes that the, uh, that the chiropractor couldn't possibly understand what was required of him, it will find that a remedy is not available. Um, many of the cases that you're referring to, though, Justice Breyer, actually involve settlements that were made uh, with the commission uh, in the course of administrative proceedings. Uh, these things do get complicated, but those are companies that agreed to settle. Justice um, Alito? <clears throat> um, uh, in answer to Justice Thomas's question, um, well, his, uh, your answer to Justice Thomas's question uh, leads me to ask this. If the activity here had ceased before this order was entered, would the court have been able to enter it? Well, so if the activity had ceased um, and it was, uh, there was no possibility that it could have resumed again, then the answer is typically no. Um, of course, there are some people who, when the FTC starts, you know, it, inquiring about them, they stop um, for the time being, only to resume again later. But if why, would Congress, why would Congress draw that line? Why would it provide uh, a, a, a restitution remedy when there is still ongoing activity, but no restitution remedy when all of the harm has already been completed? Well, uh, because the, the remedy goes along with the injunctive remedy. It's inherent in the in injunction that the court can issue, and that's what the Congress has traditionally done. It's what it did in the 19th century patent and copyright cases. Yeah, well, what, would be the policy, what would be the policy justification for doing that? Why would Congress uh, draw that line? I can't tell you why Congress would want to have a less than complete remedy, but it's, a, it's a something that Congress does quite often. It does, it's still to this day in the Securities and Exchange uh, Act cases, um, it requires an is there is about to requirement uh, before they can get the, the equitable relief. We asked Mr. Patillo questions about how this provision would have been understood in 1973. Uh, his brief cites comments made by a former FTC official, Mr. Fitzgerald, that addresses that directly. And they are pretty damaging to your position. Mr. Fitzgerald says that uh, when 13B was enacted, nobody on the commission imagined that it would become an important part of its, the commission's consumer protection program, but the commission decided that uh, Ninth, section 19 was too time consuming, so it wanted, it looked for a workaround and, uh, quote, neither the text of 13B nor its legislative history disclosed the basis to argue for broad equitable relief. The commission's attorneys thought these arguments were not going to succeed, but to their surprise, they were successful. And you don't say anything about Mr. Fitzgerald. Do you want to say something about him now? 
I'd be happy to, Justice Alito. Mr. Fitzgerald, for one thing, is not Congress, so the question is what Congress understood, and there was a huge body of law uh, indicating that Congress understood what it was doing. But beyond that, um, what Mr. Fitzgerald's article does indicate is that in the 1970s, at the time when people were complaining that the FTC was uh, lackadaisical about enforcement, the Commission's mindset was all about uh, rulemaking. Uh, making broad rules to govern large industrial sectors. And it did take uh, a little while for the Commission's mindset to change from a rulemaking to an enforcement perspective. But once it did, it uh, vigorously uh, started invoking Section 13B. And as has been pointed out by uh, the questioning, uh, courts for 40 years now have accepted those things. Uh, and before the FTC even did this, courts had been accepting uh, the exact same arguments in the SEC context. Right, thank you. Justice Sotomayor? Counsel, how do you explain Section 5L, which was passed at the same time as Section 13B and separately authorizes mandatory injunctions and further equitable relief? Why would Congress use a different language for injunctive relief in one section and just stop at injunctive relief and in the other add and further equitable relief in a set different section? Well, the textual differences in the two provisions reflect their functional differences. Section 5L is used to enforce cease and desist orders, the administrative orders. And, uh, and so there already basically is an injunction on the books. And it's an injunction that doesn't come with any traditional remedies. So Congress had to say exactly what remedies it wanted. And that's why it's limited to mandatory injunctions and other equitable relief. But in Section 13, Congress didn't need to do that. It could rely on, to piggyback on, all of the traditional remedies inherent in a permanent injunction, which is different from a mandatory injunction. And so, um, you know, you could look at it that, in fact, what Congress wanted to make sure of was that no matter how the commission proceeded, whether it proceeded by administrative, um, by cease and desist order, or whether it went into court as a litigant, that each time consumers were harmed, they would have the opportunity to get uh, redress for their victimization. Now, I'm following up slightly on Justice Alito's question. Legislative history is not unimportant to me. What am I to make of the fact that I saw nothing in the history of this bill suggesting that Congress understood that Section 13B authorizes monetary awards? Quite to the contrary, uh, the prior version of what became Section 19 triggered extensive debate because there wasn't money damages available. And Section 19 was passed to remedy what was perceived as a fault in the bill as it existed. So what am I missing in terms of the absence of anything to do with this issue before Congress? Well, you are correct, Justice Sotomayor, that uh, the legislative history does not, of uh, 13B itself, does not explicitly address money. But there is a presumption that Congress legislates against the backdrop of the law, and the backdrop of the law of injunction really couldn't be clearer. Um, now, when it comes to Section 19, the debate about monetary remedies in Section 19 had to do with the Commission's own ability to order monetary remedies in its own administrative processes as part of a cease and desist order. Um, the, as uh, Section 19 was being debated, the Ninth Circuit ruled in the Heater case, which is cited in our brief, that the Commission could not uh, order monetary remedies in its own proceedings, and that's why money was front and center in Congress's mind. Justice but, Kagan? Can, uh, Mr. Marcus, it seems to me that the best argument against your position, and, and it's a strong one, uh, comes from Section 5 and Section 19, um, which have these protections in them that Section 13 uh, do not, that there has to be a repeated violation, that there has to be a certain kind of mens rea and so forth. And, and it, it does seem as though uh, your interpretation of Section 13 
makes those pretty much entirely irrelevant. I mean, you say, well, this is a choice. There are two pathways of different kinds of administrative action. But what, what's, what seems significant about those two pathways as you've, led them, uh, as you've laid them out is that one is so clearly better from the agency's perspective. And so I'm wondering if that's the kind of choice that Congress really gave to the agency. Well, Justice Kagan, the, I think the, the core of the answer goes back to what Justice Breyer was describing in his answer to me, which was a fear of Congress that an agency would have too much power. And uh, it, Congress gave the commission the ability to address economy-wide practices uh, in, 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 under fairly broad terms. And it was concerned that the agency was going to declare novel practices to be deceptive or unfair or anti-competitive. And uh, so Congress was understandably concerned and therefore included procedural protections uh, in, you know, in, in the provisions regarding relief for agency processes. But it seems as though that's exactly why we should maintain the integrity of those protections rather than your interpretation, which essentially makes them irrelevant. It was nice that Congress once thought that, but we don't have to deal with that anymore. It, it doesn't make them irrelevant. It just makes one pathway more attractive in certain instances than another. But if the commission does encounter a novel practice or if the commission wishes to make its own fact-finding um, in, in particularly complicated cases or difficult cases, then it can do that only in the administrative pathway. So it's not, a, just a, it's not just a freebie. The commission has to give something up when it decides to go to federal court. It just so happens that, you know, there's a lot of cases that we deal with that are not particularly complicated and that do not require a lot of explanation of what deception is. There are scams that run amok all over the place. It's happening I mean, right now. Just going back to Justice Breyer's numbers, I mean, can you give me any sense of the empirics of this, how often the FTC uses the cease and desist order route uh, as opposed to the go-to-court route? I don't have exact numbers for you, Justice Kagan, but um, in most antitrust cases, the commission uses the administrative route. Uh, in uh, at least several cases a year, the commission uses the administrative route in consumer protection cases. Um, but there's no question that the agency brings far more cases in court than it does in the administrative process. Justice but again, Gorsuch? that largely reflects the... Uh, Justice Gorsuch? Oh, counsel, finish your answer. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Oh, thank you. Uh, that largely reflects the, the kind of basic deceptiveness of much of the stuff that we deal with on the consumer protection side. Well, let's focus on the consumer protection side, because I think the antitrust side, there are a lot more standards out there um, that, that um, people are familiar with. But, but Justice Breyer really does um, remind us of the, of the history here. You know, the, the FTC was set up in part to enact rules about deceptive conduct. It chose not to go that route, preferred an enforcement route, um, and, and recognizing that a term like deceptive practices in Section 5 is not exactly self-defining and may lack some of the substance that we now have, at least under the Sherman Act and, and in the antitrust context, laid out a bunch of protections in Section 19 before your money can be taken away. Uh, we've all kind of wandered around this question, but is, isn't our, I think our core concern is you're, you're rendering that those protections superfluous, that there's very little incentive for the agency to ever comply with them. And it's just a, another step uh, away from uh, what Congress had anticipated would be a regulatory regime that's never materialized. Well, certainly, um, uh, Justice Gorsuch, Congress did seem to recognize the issue, and that's why it included savings clauses in Section 19. Uh, you know, I, I don't see much other explanation uh, for very broad provisions that 
clearly on their face say this is in addition to other remedies and you can't use the uh, existence of this provision to interpret other uh, remedies. Let, let, let me put the question a different way. What incentive does the Commission have today to use Section 19? The Commission has the incentives that I've discussed, which are if it wishes to engage in its own fact-finding and use uh, and draw its own legal conclusions to address yes, but it, novel it, that's conduct. That's so terribly difficult, um, and Section 13 is so comparatively easy. W what incentive remains to do that? I know it can, but why would it? Just as it can come up with rules defining what unfair trade practices are, but, but chooses not to do so. Well, it well it does. I mean, so it, it doesn't do it as often, but it does do it. Uh, and so that proves that there are cases where the commission thinks we need to take this one. This one's difficult enough. This one's uncertain enough. This one requires our application of agency expertise. And um, the commission has to give up all that when it goes to federal court. Now, some would say that it's actually better to have uh, a commission litigating cases in federal court than it is to have the commission making broad-based rules that uh, may apply to the non-parties. Uh, thank you, Kevin. So, Justice Kavanaugh? Uh, thank you, Chief Justice, and uh, good morning, Mr. Marcus. Good to be with you again. I want to pick up on Justice Alito's uh, question in Mr. Fitzgerald's uh, article, which I've read. Uh, you obviously put forward good arguments on Porter and the court's precedent and Congress's uh, intent, as well as the body of court of appeals cases, but it seems that the problem you have is the text. And in that sense, uh, this case really is a separation of powers case. Uh, I, I worked in the executive branch for many years, so I understand how this happens. When you're in the executive branch or an independent agency, you want to do good things and prevent or punish bad things, and sometimes your statutory authority is borderline, uh, and it could be war policy or immigration or environmental or what have you. But with good intentions, the agency pushes the envelope and stretches the statutory language to do the good or prevent the bad. The problem is this results in a transfer of power uh, from Congress to the executive branch to decide whether to exercise this new authority. And that's a particular concern, at least for me, with independent agencies. So uh, now why isn't the answer here for the agency to seek this new authority for Congress for us to uh, maintain the principle that uh, separation of powers, that the agency should stick to the authority in the in the text and the and not go beyond that. Uh, Thirty thousand foot question. Interest in your responses to that. Well, so uh, again, the question, the real question, is what was Congress's intent when it gave the commission the authority to seek a permanent injunction in federal court, and if it intended to accord the agency the, ab the ability to go ask a court for all of the inherent equitable remedies, then I think that resolves your concern about separation of powers issues. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it, it couldn't be clearer that the Congress legislating against the backdrop of injunctions would have had the intent to accord all the traditional equitable remedies. Um, and, you know, this is, not a, this is not a new question. Even, uh, you know, in the California versus American Stories case, as you said in our brief, the court held that injunction, as used in the Clayton Act, indicates Congress's intention that traditional principles of equity govern the grant of, injunction, of injunctive relief. And so, uh, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, I, I think the, the, your concern is a valid one, but is resolved if you look at what Congress would have understood the words to mean when it used them. And there was, in fact, a common understanding of what injunction meant in 1973. Uh, appreciate it, Mr. Marcus. Thank you. Justice Barrett? Counsel, the... the Damages award here, or the money at stake here, was $1.3 billion, and then the $27 million collected from Mr. Tucker's wife. And when Justice Alito asked Mr. Patillo how much of that had been distributed to the victims, he said uh, about $500 million. So I, I take it the rest of that is in the Treasury, or does the FTC have it right now? 
So um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, Justice Barrett. Um, I uh, will get you a clarification on what Mr. Patillo said, because the money that's actually been distributed from consumers comes from a different defendant, not Tucker, not Mrs. Tucker, not any of the petitioners before this court. It comes from a bank that settled separately with the government and agreed to a restitution remedy in the criminal case uh, that the Justice Department then turned over to the FTC to distribute to consumers. So none of that money is the judgment in this particular case. So what happens or has happened to the judgment, the money flowing from the judgment in this particular case? So um, right now there's some money that is being held in an account uh, separately uh, for, for redress should the commission ultimately wind up with the ability to... How much money, money in that account compared to the $1.3 billion? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's a, a, a tens of millions. It's a, it's a lot of money. But this is what I'm, I'm getting at. It seems to me that equitable remedies attempt to restore the plaintiff to the position in which the plaintiff stood before the plaintiff was defrauded. This money isn't traceable back to the SEC, and the money that's gained isn't all being distributed to the plaintiffs. So it seems like it functions almost more like a fine. It doesn't really seem analogous to, say, restitution to me. Well, I'm not sure that's quite correct, because uh, the the point here is that it's it's, it's an equitable remedy meant to restore the victims to the place that they were in before they were ripped off. But if the and victims don't get the money, or if all the money is not traceable to the victims, that, that, then all the money is not remedying that wrong. Well, no, we know, we know who the victims were, and we know how much they were, we know how much was stolen from each of them. It's just a matter of collecting the money, figuring out from this case, whether we are allowed to give back the money and then basically cutting checks to everybody. Right now, the money is being held in safekeeping. So the full $1.3 billion will be distributed to the victims? As much of it as we can get, yes. Uh, We're not going to get $1.3 billion. A lot of it was um, spent and it doesn't exist anymore. And, uh, you know, Tucker is now judgment-proof for the most part. But um, there were bank accounts, houses, race cars, uh, whatever, assets that were seized and uh, are being held basically in trust. For Thank the you, counsel. My time's expired. A minute to wrap up, Mr. Marcus. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, I want to reiterate that a court with the power of injunction sits as, as a court of equity. And uh, one thing that uh, the court should not overlook is the basic principle of equity that wrongdoers have to give back the money that they took unlawfully. AMG asks the court to disregard that principle, but the court should have that principle firmly in mind when it decides this case. It should uphold the history and tradition and affirm once again that a permanent injunction includes the power to restore victim money that was wrongfully taken from them. And I don't think that uh, that anything in Sections 19 or 5L rise to the level of an unmistakable inference, which is the standard that is required under Porter. So the court should affirm the judgment below. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Uh, rebuttal, Mr. Patillo? I heard the commission say that this case should be decided by looking at Congress's intent when it enacted 13B. And the way we determine Congress's intent is by looking at the words on the page. Congress used the word injunction with a clear historical meaning. Even if, in certain cases like Porter and Mitchell, that term might be construed to carry with it other equitable remedies, we know that's not the case here. Even under Porter and Mitchell, Porter and Mitchell make clear that you must look at the statute and ask if another feature impliedly precludes broader relief. The Commission suggests that standard isn't met here, but all we have to do is look at Porter. In Porter, the existence of another provision providing a damages remedy was sufficient for the court to conclude that it should not also imply that same damages remedy into the provision at issue. That is precisely what the Commission is trying to do here. It is trying to get precisely the same relief 
that would have been available under 5L, injunctions and other equitable relief. It's trying to get precisely the same relief available under Section 19, but without complying with any of its safeguards. I heard the Commission say that sometimes pathways, one pathway might be more attractive. Well, of course it's going to be more attractive for the Commission to proceed under Section 13 and Section 19, where it doesn't have to comply with, for example, the heightened proof requirement where it doesn't have to comply with the limitations period. I I didn't hear a single response to why Congress would have intended to uh, allow the same relief under two pathways, yet only provide protections in in one but not the other. And the absence of a limitations period is something that Megrig pointed out. It would be truly striking for a statute to award retrospective monetary relief, but not include a statute of limitations. That applies equally here but even more so when you consider what the Commission's core mission is here. Here, the the Commission first investigated this conduct. It first asked Mr. Tucker about his disclosures in 2002. Yet, subject to no limitations period, it sat on its hands for a decade. Now, if it were following the prescriptions that Congress provided, in 2002, if it thought that there was something wrong with the disclosures, it should have gone in then. It should have sought to bring a stop to it, it, could have gone, it should have gone to administrative processes to make clear that this particular remedy, or excuse me, that these particular disclosures, which were widespread throughout the industry, were in fact not acceptable in a violation of the 5L Act. But it didn't do that. And this case shows precisely why holding the commission to its core mission of providing prospective, monetary, uh, prospective guidance to business about what conduct is prohibited is so important. It's exactly what Congress intended, and the entire structure of the, of the commission's mission is being altered by it choosing to go down the easy path of render, racking up huge judgments under 13B without the protections that Congress provided under Section 19. If there are no further questions, I would ask that the judgment of the Court of Appeals be reversed. Thank, Thank you, you, counsel. The case is submitted.